So the age of reason, the enlightenment. So the big thing about this one, it's very important to compare this to the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution, specifically Newton, came up with like the mathematical formula for the universe. He's like, well, if you think about the mathematical formula of the universe, couldn't we come up with using science, scientific ideas, and reason, come up with natural laws for the way societies function? Can't we do that? And they're going to try, and you'll see elements of this. So we'll go through a few for these philosophers who will do this, but we can come up with laws. Just as Newton came up with laws. By the way, then, what would be that religion of the Enlightenment, where if, if all the universe is dictated by mathematical formulas, who was the, I don't want to say the mathematician, but the clockmaker uh, who started everything, the creator, what was the name of that religion? Or that more of a philosophy? Burn. Nothing was there. The universe existed. It came with all the mathematical formulas. So all the universe worked together. And then they flipped. Trying to flip the switch. Then flip the switch. Deism. Yep, that's deism. Well, can't we do it for our interaction here? And this really gets to that Renaissance idea you start seeing with humanism, where we can order society. We can make society function for us. As it turned out, turns out, and we should know this by things that happen, let me give you an example. Now, it's very difficult to order society. But still, if we get it out, and they kept talking about this, we take our fears and our superstitions and bring it out to the cold light of reason. Which, by the way, it does have that element of, therefore, let me, who is, I am one of the elite, I understand, I will decide. And so, you can take the scientific method and bring it to society. Inductive and deductive reasoning. Observe, hypothesis, experiment, we can do this. The problem is, how do you experiment with society? That starts to sound pretty scary. But that's where the beginnings of the social sciences. Now, they're not called that yet. You won't see this to the beginning of the 19th century. I'm sorry, beginning of the 20th century. And that's things like history, sociology, economics. Um, government will turn into political science. Which you know, how we can take politics into a science, which <laughs> is almost, it's so laughable now. <laughs> when you really think about it, wow. And because uh, as much, it's, people are weird. Have you noticed that? Not this year. Yeah, go out there and you'll be shocked. But all those ideas click. And so we can progress as people through law, if we can come up with like these steps, and they literally call them natural laws. For those of you who have read the Declaration of Independence, it says nature's gods and nature's laws. That's what it's talking about. The United States is really a child of the Enlightenment, and therefore education is important. Education. Because if we expect human beings to understand their society and progress and make decisions based upon this, they need to know. And that's why it's important for them to know their history and how the government functions and how societies function. And one of the things about the Enlightenment is you'll get this idea that if people do not know, they'll be taken advantage of by dictators or kings or monarchs. In fact, if you want to be leader and be unquestioned, wouldn't it be best to keep people in the dark? Like, let me throw an example out there. Like, we're in Russia right now. What do you know about the invasion of Ukraine? The peacekeepers. Yeah. Everything's going great. I just sent you the fake news. Yeah. Which is everything. Yeah, that's, they're, they're keeping the fake news out. And that's where we get these. So, we'll come back to the philosopher named Barack Spinoza, but Spinoza really is this tie-in 
between the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. For his ideas, God is nature. The creator is nature. Look at the beauty and the complexities of nature. He was kind of obsessed with Newton's laws. Newton just blew everyone's mind. It is pretty remarkable. Yeah, he invented gravity. Like that's yeah, I don't know. We just fly from the space into the glass spheres that rotate and all yeah. those disappear because of Newton. Now we don't need to fly anymore. <laughs> and so with that, but God is equal to nature. It's the same thing. So let's get to a couple things. First off, we've got to do a little bit of John Locke. Now, don't write these down. Just put down John Locke. He started writing just at the age of the Glorious Revolution. But there is one book we need to know. Let's put down the two treatises of government. And some of you have read parts about this. Locke is, is hard to read. He's an interesting fella. And uh, he's very uh, hawk like nose. I have a relatively big nose, so I understand. And broken, <laughs> broken it twice. My advice to you, don't break your nose. Don't hit your nose, that'll break it. That's all that. No, don't do it. It's not right. Because you know it only takes two pads and four to actually break your nose and go in there. Depends what the angle you hit, but yeah. Well, I mean, you might have two pounds of force. It's going to be right there. Right there. We shouldn't talk about this, though. But it's hard to get that right angle. Mine was a wall. Okay, with that. <laughs> no, the first one was a wall, the second one was a floor. Both going downstairs. All right, so, two treatises of government, huh? I don't think you should play basketball. That was the worst of my problem. He was the so, first dunker ever. Huh? He was the first dunker ever, right? I did dunk once. <laughs> <laughs> once in a game. Did it, though? All right. John Locke's philosophy. Let's talk a little bit about his basic philosophy. Lots of statues of Locke. <laughs> That's in London at the um, the portrait gallery there. And portrait gallery is actually, if you think, oh, I don't want to see a bunch of portraits, it's really cool. I really didn't want to go see it. I thought, oh, there's more stuff to do in London. I am so glad I did it. But here's the thing about it is that the individual all individuals are rational creatures. Now, so we're rational creatures. That means that we can make up our mind and decide, and we're not dependent upon somebody else for our livelihood. In fact, you'll see this, you know, it's well before the Enlightenment, a great effect. And to be a virtuous person, whatever you might define as virtue or morality, be a good, honorable person, that is something you learn. It is practice. It doesn't come naturally. But we do it through rational thought. But the problem with that is, therefore, you can, through your own rational thought, become immoral. And we all possess free will. We decide our own fate. He was not a Calvinist. But that idea of Calvinism, where there is not this interactive um, God decide our fate, we decide our fate. It was very much evident. First, Calvinists believe in the inter interactive God, which is that God made the decision at the creation of the earth, the creation of the universe. I wonder why it's so slow. So, such things as freedom is a matter of free will, but also obedience. We have the freedom to be obedient to a leader that might protect us. But that obedience to a leader or a government should be based upon our thinking. We have a conviction that is best for us to obey. That's why governments are necessary. We have that ability to decide that. And obedience for our protection and the freedom to make that decision. Exercising freedom does not mean doing whatever you want. It is by making a choice based upon your convictions. And he also said that divine right was pure nonsense. If we have free will and are rational, no one is picking who will be the king except for us. 
you can really imagine that when they were going to overthrow King James II, Locke, is, it, um, Locke would become great justification for it. James II is not there because of divine right. He is there because he had power, and, now, and we gave him that, and now we have changed our mind. If we're obedient to our king, it's our choice, our conviction, and we can change our mind. So, therefore, all of us have certain rights endowed by God. Jefferson was a deist, so he would put in the Declaration of Independence rights endowed by the Creator, the one who flipped the switch. By the way, that's why I have the very stylized painting of Independence Hall, writing of the, the uh, Declaration of Independence. It's Jefferson. I'm right. I'm not in this one. No. I was in France. So what are these rights? Life, liberty, and property. And you notice these are not laws. Law said that we have these rights. By the way, what is life? Not death. Oh, put your head down. <laughs> so get down life. Life is independence. We decide our own fate. You ever got that? Life is independence. A lot of things are alive and not dead. A slave is alive and not dead. A cow is alive and not dead. We have independence. I guess some have. Because he's writing this just, just before England became the great slave trading nation of the world. Eh, we'll change. We'll, we'll play with that one. What's liberty? Well, liberty goes back to this concept here. We're freedom. We can decide. But it's based upon our convictions. Or... Write down liberty is freedom of conscience. We decide based upon our morality. Freedom of conscience. Freedom is not to do anything you want, because anything you want might deprive somebody else of their rights. And then, of course, property. What's property? It's more than that. The right to not have your property taken away from you. Your property cannot be taken away from you. The British have, remember, they thought this was the empire of liberty until it infringed on, or they didn't mind infringing on other people's liberty. Property is truly free. If you have property, you can make true decisions. If you don't have property, or your property can be taken away at any time, you are dependent upon somebody else for your livelihood. If somebody can take away everything you own, you are not free. You have no life or liberty because you are always beholden to that person who can take your stuff away. If you live in a society where everything you have can be taken away by a drop of hat by somebody in power, Somebody irrational, somebody like me, perhaps, that you are dependent upon me. And therefore, you do not have liberty. You have no other chance. Hello, sorry for the interruption. Any seniors that are interested in listening to um, some information from MSU Billings, they are down in the Career Center. Please sit down, Ms. Herndon will write you a pass. MSU B. Shut off. Shut off. Hit the button. I'm always aware when they act, don't forget to that and they might swear or something. Or start bad mouthing somebody. That partridge is an idiot. What? All right. So, and therefore, if people have free will, we have rights. Governments get their power from the people, aka us. What's a bell right? Oh, okay, let's put, um, let's put right there. <laughs> okay, a little bit tomorrow, then I'll give you a map. Sound good? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Pursuit of happiness. 
We have eminent domain, you know. We have, we have to make sure we can buy property. Well, we all have different definitions of ownership of property. Yeah? Have a good day, everybody. Okay, we still have the speaker on in there. You're in the background. Yeah.